Um, although we are virtual and joining from different physical locations, I still really like to do a land acknowledgement of the land that Sierra Nevada University sits on in Incline Village. It's traditional Washoe land. The Washoe people have lived, thrived, and stewarded this land long before the school was here. So we acknowledge the Washoe people for their care of this land and pay our respects to elders past and present. We keep in our minds and our hearts the loss of indigenous lives here and around the world that we're complicit to. Thank you. Um, we have so many new faces here tonight. So I just wanna do like a huge welcome to you all for joining us. Um, for those of you who don't know me, sorry for the ones who do, I'm sure you're tired of this spiel. I'm Anza Yarshka, I use the pronouns they, them. I'm the gallery director at Sierra Nevada University. And um, I will be kind of moderating the show. So if you need anything, I'm your point person. Um, for those of you who don't know, which probably most of you do, Sierra Nevada University is a small liberal arts um, college that's located just two blocks from Lake Tahoe. Um, this is being hosted by both kind of the fine arts department that oversees the gallery, as well as the MFA and interdisciplinary arts program. So we offer BAs and BFAs in undergrad that are fully on campus. And then we have our low residency MFA in interdisciplinary arts, which Scott is an alum of. So um, obviously we're big fans of that program. Um, if you have any questions about either of those programs, please hit me up. I have plenty of information about those. Um, I am looking at my notes and I guess now I get to introduce Scott, which is so exciting. Um, as I mentioned, Scott graduated in 2020, actually this year in January, which feels like a really long time ago. I was like, Scott, you graduated like two years ago, right? just January, um, from the MFA in Interdisciplinary Arts Program here at SNU. Here, I'm in Reno. Um, and Scott is a movement-based performance and teaching artist who's making work. We've got some feedback. Um, just gonna, okay. Uh, Scott is a movement-based performance and teaching artist making work that encourages moments of collective intimacy through interdisciplinary vehicles of vulnerability. He is the co-founder director of Subcircle Artist Residency that's located in Biddeford, Maine. And um, he'll tell you, I'm sure, more than that, but that's at least like a little taste of what's going to be happening or who we're dealing with tonight. Um, so we've got the recording going. Be aware of that. Um, we love being in community here and seeing your faces, so you are welcome to leave your videos on um, throughout Scott's um, engagement. He'll be giving more directions or more um, kind of information about that. And then at the end, we're going to have a Q&A, and again, we invite people to turn on their videos so we can um, be in community even from afar together. Um, so I think with enough chit chat, I'm going to hand it off to Scott. Thank you. Um, welcome everyone. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, this is Second Nature. Uh, my name is Scott McPeters. Thank you for that introduction, Anza. Um, and yeah, uh, bear with me as I sort of clumsily bounce between screens and read notes and manage two computers at once. <laughs> um, but I just want to say I feel really honored to be a part of the SNU community. Um, and I want to fully acknowledge that it's been a really trying day for a lot of folks. So just showing up has been a big ask and, and I really appreciate you being here. Um, that said, I will not be offended if you have to leave early. Um, and yeah, I'll be leading a few movement meditations throughout the, this workshop uh, presentation. And feel free to leave your videos off if that makes you feel more comfortable or if you wanna participate more fully and be seen in a different way, so that, that can be exciting too. Feel free to turn your screen on. Um, so I just wanna start by reading this uh, Krista Tippett quote that I've been inspired by recently. 
Um, we create transformative, resilient new realities by becoming transformed, resilient people. Okay, so um, this is an attempt at articulating a project and process that I consider to be very mid project. And it's, it's early mid stages and also a continuation of my thesis work um, that I conducted last year. So I'm gonna speak a little bit about uh, my current research, do a little bit of storytelling, um, show some video, read a little bit of writing, uh, and as I said, sprinkle in a few movement meditations along the way. Um, but being asked to present uh, on this platform has challenged me to deconstruct my practice a little bit and sort of parse out the different pieces and understand how they uh, all fit together. Um, during the past few weeks, I've been working a lot at the artist residency that Anza mentioned that I co-direct and um, just around the town where I grew up in and I'm staying at right now and have been playing with a lot of the invasive species that are here. And so the image that you're seeing now is a sort of deconstruction of a bittersweet vine that I've been having fun with, um, both putting it as a bouquet and then sort of unraveling these berries and the husks of berries. So what you're seeing is the, the berry husk in the yellow, the berry uh, in the middle, and then at the very center is the sort of uh, nexus of where those two meet, sort of the inside of the berry stem and where the husk connects to the berry and then the green part of the stem connecting um, to the branch. And so it's just sort of been a nice little a metaphor and, and emblem relating to how I feel like I'm working through deconstructing my practice right now. So thank you for bearing witness to this practice. <laughs> um, <clears throat> again, I want to say a little bit about the movement meditations. Again, feel free to turn your video off when you're doing that, if that makes you feel comfortable. And also, I just want to say that these aren't designed to challenge you in a specific way. It's just um, a way to keep embodied throughout this presentation and sort of embody what I'm, what I'm talking about in the presentation. Um, but really take it at your own pace, depending on where you are physically, mentally, you can be as, as big or as small. You can do all of them just with your hand or fingertip or even just through breathing. So just wanted to say that before we start. And this uh, image is another invasive project that I did um, collecting Japanese wisteria from the property. And then the berries are um, a multiflora rose hip. Um, so I've, I've just been playing with the invasive species on our property recently and having a lot of fun with that. So we're going to start right away with um, a movement score um, that's all about taking up space. Um, so all the movement scores that I'm going to be leading you through this evening are inspired by the resiliency of invasive plant species. Um, and one thing that they all have in common is that they're not afraid to take up space at all. Um, and so they've evolved and developed traits that have allowed them to thrive even in the most harsh conditions. Um, so regardless of where you are right now, what your mental or physical state is right now, I'm just going to encourage you to expand a little bit. And the way we can experience our greatest expansiveness is by also experiencing the opposition, which is contraction. So this is essentially an expansion and contraction exercise. And again, you can experience this just by breathing, right? We expand and contract our lungs every time we take a deep breath. But we're going to try and if you do choose to move with the rest of your body, we're going to coordinate our action with our breath. So for our inhalations, we'll expand in some way. And again, we can expand with our own physical body into our own physical space, or also we can expand into the virtual space. Yeah, and take up space that way, which is just another way to have fun with this. Um, so we'll take, uh, it says 20 breaths. We're going to take 10 collective breaths together. <laughs> um, that felt really long when I did it earlier. So we're not going to do that. And I didn't edit it. Um, but we'll just do it. Take a collective breath first together before we get started. 
and then we'll we'll start the 10 breaths. I want to say one other thing. I had a teacher once um, a while ago, Peggy Baker, who's one of my favorite teachers. Uh, there are a few people on here who are familiar with Peggy. And I was really struck when she talked about the the pleasure sensation that toddlers get when they put their feet on the ground for the first time and they experience the sensation of extending yeah after being curled and moving out of this fetal state the pleasure of like, taking up space and becoming erect and extending into space and i feel like we lose track of that a little bit as we age and are all like contracting into our phones and computer spaces so just wanting to sort of imbue this space with with pleasure as well like enjoy the full range of your action as you uh expand and contract and you can maybe experiment with staying sort of in uh, one end of the range you know if you take a full breath and expand Hold there maybe for a second so that you can really experience the pleasure, the pleasure of contraction that comes, comes after. So again, let's just take one breath together in and out. And then we can start physicalizing this breath as you see fit, as you want. So I think that was 10 for me. Physic finish at your own time if you're not complete yet. So hopefully you already feel a little bit shifted <laughs> as a result of that. Like I do, like, oh yeah, here I am. Here's my body. Um, so before going on, I want to say a bunch of thank yous. Um, so a lot of what I talk about this evening comes out of conversations that I've had with a a lot of SNU folks, um, uh, mentors that I've had, um, teachers, peers. Um, so specifically, I want to thank Mary Jays, Julie Weitz, Dan Paz, Rachel Zollinger, and Karen Krolak, um, who I've been talking a lot about this process of working through invasiveness and physical empathy practices. Um, I also want to thank my partner, Michael Poulsen, um, who's an anthropologist and is constantly pointing me towards intellectuals and academics who have asked the same questions that I'm asking and have gotten a lot deeper than I've gotten in, <laughs> in different ways. Um, I also want to thank my parents, even Peter McFeeters, who've taken us in during this time. So we're located in Maine right now and it feels really great and safe to be here. So thank you, mom and dad. And then um, finally, last but not least, Eli Nixon, who I'll talk uh, more in depth about later who's become a, a collaborator and shares a passion for these physical empathy practices. I also want to uh, just give a shout out to Octavia Butler and the Parable of the Sower as well as Krista Tippett's book Becoming Wise. These have been um, great guiding forces. I really encourage you uh, to take a look at these books if you have not already. So resiliency, da, 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 the theme of this evening. Um, I want to talk about this word because it's so present in our lives right now. Um, we hear it talked about all the time. I've heard it a lot in um, election advertisements. We've been praised for how resilient we are um, as people moving through this pandemic and 
that is true, but I, I think we often talk about resiliency as if it's something that's happened to us, or we look back and are like, wow, we changed and adapted so quickly. How did that happen? And we don't talk about the, the uh, practice that has been our changed habitual routines for the last seven months. Um, yeah, we wash our hands more regularly, we social distance, uh, we interact through Zoom uh, on a more consistent basis, we wear masks, all these things that were a little bit less familiar to us have suddenly become second nature. Yeah, so that's the title of this presentation because I I've just started to think about what else could become second nature for me that's actually a choice that I make versus a constraint that's been placed on me because I think we've all sort of experienced um, some positivity as well as neg negativity that's come out of these shifts that we've had to make. And I'm just curious with, with a more intention-based practice of resiliency, like what might we be able to manifest? So the term resilient, resiliency is also typically viewed when we're in opposition to something that's potentially harmful. Yeah, so it's a reactive term. Yeah, it's something that like we've built armor against this other force rather than seeing it as something that's a preventative measure. So I also have a question about how resiliency practices can focus more on sustainability um, rather than reactivity. And let it be a practice that maybe reorients our own actions and relationship to the more than human world, which is what I've been focusing on. So this brings me to um, my thesis project from last year, because re resiliency is something that I was thinking about a lot um, during that time as well. Uh, so my thesis was a performance and social practice experiments uh, inspired by the resiliency of deer ticks specifically. And so deer ticks became a metaphor for how I experienced being queer in rural spaces. Uh, and so it became a project about trying to identify how states of belonging are manifested in different spaces. Uh, and I was particularly inspired by the resiliency of the deer tick that thrives despite the tremendous fear and hate that exists surrounding them. Yeah, so these are just a few images from that process. Um, uh, a lot of these images are taken with me in a tick costume around downtown Biddeford, um, where I am right now. And then towards the end of my thesis research, I started to think about resiliency in relationship to Darwin's term, the survival of the fittest. And I wondered, what does it actually mean to be fit right now? Um, I wanted to challenge our more prescriptive notion of fitness as being the result of going to the gym or taking a yoga class or going for a run. Um, so I decided to start a tick fitness series uh, that is very much in process. I'm, I'm considering this as a part of the tick fitness series and it'll be made up of a series of resiliency practices inspired by other species in more than human world. Um, so I wanted to show you the promotional video that I made for Tick Fitness that was a part of my uh, thesis show in January. Yeah, Spider-Man and Freaking Full Effect. Uh -huh. wrong? I'm ready. You ready, dude? I'm ready, Slick, are you? Oh, yeah. Take it down. Girl, I must warn you. I sense something strange in my mind. Yo, situation is serious. Let's cure it, cause we're running out of time. Um, so it's still in sort of a coming soon stage. This is actually maybe one of the first tick fitness uh, practices um, that will become a um, podcast or, or vlog or something like that. But I'm, I'm hoping that it becomes a conversation with other artists like Eli Nixon, um, who are thinking about physical empathy practices uh, and science scientists too, who are um, maybe researching the resiliency of more than human world. 
So with that said, um, oh no, don't play again. Um, so empathy uh, is another word that we hear a lot. Um, and I think the greatest fitness that needs to be practiced right now is empathy. Um, this is what guided me to become a deer tick. Uh, I wanted to become it so that I would have a different relationship with it what, that wasn't so fear-based. I wanted to figure out a way to exist in um, community with it. Um, so through that process, I ended up connecting the dots that deer, tick, deer ticks and gay men are, have both been stigmatized at different times uh, for a disease that they may or may not carry. So empathy can come in many different ways. Um, but when we hear empathy spoken, it's usually spoken really incorrectly or to mean that we're really sympathizing with someone. But actually the definition of empathy is the capacity to understand or feel what another person is experiencing from within their frame of reference. That is the capacity to place oneself in another's position. <clears throat> So with that said, empathy is physical, right? It's action-based. It requires a transformation from one's more habitual orientation. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm thinking of a true physical empathy practice um, as a way to reckon with the experience of another being through your own container. So a physical empathy practice is an anti-racist practice. It's an anti-white supremacist practice. It's anti-anthropocentrist. Um, and I'll talk more about empathy later, but I wanted to share my personal favorite example that I've come across recently of a cross speak of cross species empathy. I worked at a farm uh, for the last two months being a farmhand and picked this carrot. That is a carrot taking a knee. <laughs> which I thought was amazing. Um, so why invasive species? Why invasive plant species? So in June, I moved back uh, here to Biddeford, Maine, um, which is my hometown. And I co-direct an artist residency, which is in this image. And as a part of returning home in a more permanent way after 17 years, I wanted to know more who I was in community with. So I decided to conduct a Know My Neighbors project that because of COVID started with identifying the plant species that were in my immediate proximity. So I downloaded the Picture This app, um, which is very useful. It's, it's very, very good at identifying most plants except for apple trees, oddly. It thinks every apple tree is a paradise apple. Um, and so as soon as I started identifying the plants on my property, uh, this is what I came up against. Wild carrot, unwanted. Common milkweed, unwanted. What's this? Prairie fleabane, unwanted. Um, sorry. Oops. Uh, goldenrod, unwanted. Curly dock, unwanted. Burdock, unwanted. So um, roughly 95% of the plants that I identified um, on our property were labeled as unwanted. And I was struck, uh, maybe, maybe not surprised, uh, by the negative language used in this app to describe plant species, um, which is also very present in other plant ID manuals and, and apps. And it reminded me of my thesis research, thinking about belonging and when I was starting to collect all the ways that Mainers label themselves and others as native or from here or from away or being a summer person or being a local. And just thinking about how all these labels create boundaries and barriers of belonging. And by using this language of wanted or unwanted to describe plants, we're situating ourselves as the keepers of belonging within the more than human world, which seems just totally ridiculous to me. And um, these invasives are particularly unwanted and undesirable because they're in competition with wanted or cultivated species that are determined by humans. So they're wanted or unwanted based on whether or not we as humans deem them useful. Oops. So it was impossible for me to 
conduct this research and see this language without also thinking about white supremacy, xenophobia, hate speech, slavery, immigration, colonialism, it's all there. Anytime we research how we exist in relationship to the other, there's a history of us determining the value of anything based on how useful it is to us or not at any given moment. Um, and as a side note, many invasives um, like dandelion, uh, purslane, um, lamb's quarters, which you'll see in a second, are some of the most nutrient rich foods that exist, right? Um, and many invasives are also great plant medicines, but they interfere with our grocery store, grocery store food production and our ability to profit from the more desirable plants that we're used to eating. So they're unwanted because they interfere with capitalism and our entitlement to land use. So while I was working at Spiller Farm um, last month or, and starting in September, um, the owner, Bill Spiller, I was asking him about this weed invasive um, particularly, which is called lamb's quarters and excuse the image pun. Um, which lamb's quarters is usually green throughout the summer, but it turns in this amazing rainbow kaleidoscope of colors uh, in the fall, which was really striking to me. And I appreciated that he was uh, both annoyed and in deep sort of reverence of of this plant. He, he said to me at some point that someone really needed to conduct a really resiliency study on this plant because it thrives in heat and cold in drought, uh, in floods. It just survives against all odds, basically. Um, and then I also wanted to point you to kudzu which is, is not as present in Maine specifically, but is one of the most powerful invasives in our country and was actually the first invasive plant species that I had an obsession with because in 2005, I was on tour with a children's theater company performing the role of the Blue Fairy in Pinocchio and um, saw this, these kudzu vines just blanketing the South. And so I started to research kudzu uh, way back then and found that it was introduced to uh, the U.S. in Philadelphia in the first World's Fair in 1876 as a beautiful ornamental plant from Japan that was also great erosion control. And so it was celebrated as this wonder oh. um, mm. and was uh, known for its growing speed. It grows about a foot a day. And so we took it and we planted it everywhere. And now this is what has happened. And so it's now transitioned from being called the wonder vine to now being referred to as the cuss you vine or the green scourge, scourge. And so at that moment as a 21 year old driving through the South, I was seeing the country, the whole country for the first time and started thinking a lot about what it means to be American and just starting to identify the ways in which we're the real invasive species. Yeah. Um, and so again, any species that challenge our human entitlement to land use and manipulation of the more than human world, I find really interesting because it shows us a kind of strength and resilience that we don't really know what to do with and that we can't control. So as a dance artist, um, the way that we as humans try and police and manipulate the movements of these invasive plant species um, makes me think about the way that we police our own actions and movement patterns um, based on their value of utility and productivity. Um, so for the most part, our actions have been distilled down to what we refer to as pedestrian action, and these are our movement norms. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a image of me in one of my first Philadelphia gigs as a Philly car share green man, which you may know from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, where someone's always trying to beat up the green man. That was me. Um, and I put this image, no one was actually trying to beat me up. I wasn't actually in that thing, but it was based on something that I portrayed. And I put this image here because our movement as green men was sort of an exaggeration of the pedestrian. It's like, we're walking down the street. We're putting a car in the ignition, a key in the ignition, you know, just these over-exaggerated gestures of what it means to be pedestrian. So pedestrian action serves a specific function, which is very unlike 
our early childhood movements. If you remember back when I'm talking about the pleasure of extending for the first time, um, pedestrian action is taught to us and has zero to do with experimentation and pleasure, whereas, you know, our, our childlike movement is more based in play and exploration and experimentation. And I've always been attracted to improvisational dance and authentic movement practices, specifically because they reignite the sensitive body. And the idea is that you practice asking your body questions like, what do you need? What would feel good right now? And it's all about asking questions and moving through the answers. And nowhere in this practice is there a right or wrong answer. It's entirely subjective. Um, so that brings me to our next movement exercise, which is all about squirming. <laughs> um, so I want to do a bit of a squirm meditation inspired by the way in which vines like kudzu and bittersweet move in this continuous three-dimensional way. Um, squirming is an act of outgrowing yourself or attempting to stretch beyond. And it's what a lot of us do first thing in the morning, right? When we've been curled up or in one position for way too long and our immediate impulse is to stretch and grow. And we find pleasure in that. And usually that's the only time that we do that in our entire day, right? And um, so these vines survive through squirm techniques, both underground and above ground. The roots are constantly moving through um, bits of rock and soil, squirming their way and creating this network and foundation for themselves. Whereas above ground, they're doing this spiraling action. And even when they come in contact with an obstacle, they keep spiraling around it and using that to their advantage. So for um, a minute, I'm just gonna ask us to squirm. And this is just reaching into that sort of pleasure sensor, center of your body and just like feeling what wants to be stretched, asking your body what needs to be moved and just going for it. So um, I'm going to put on a little timer and we'll get that going. Okay. Here we go. So just start asking yourself what would feel good and move from there. Yeah. Just stretch into yourself. Ask your body questions, move through the answers. There's no specific shape or desired outcome other than you enjoying it. Great. And that was a minute. So feel free if you like to keep doing this. You don't have to sit back down in your chair. If that feels good and you want to keep going, keep squirming it out. I highly encourage it. I just have to keep talking. <laughs> so this brings me to Eli Nixon. Um, so I started to think even more about these empathy practices and physical acts of becoming like my tick project when I was introduced um, to Eli Nixon. So as quoted from Eli's website, Eli builds portals and gives guided tours to places that don't yet exist. They collaborate on imaginative interventions through cardboard constructionism, playwriting and choreography, choreography of low tech public spectacula with an AH, very New England AH. So currently Eli is making work um, embodying a horseshoe crab and is in the process of developing a manual that any community might use to be able to host their own horseshoe crab pageant. And the manual will include various drawings, writings, costume pieces, and directions for somatic experiences embodying horseshoe crabs. 
So Eli and I found one another on Instagram while I was conducting my thesis research. And we started talking on the phone about our paralleled admirations of the resiliency of ticks and horseshoe crabs. Um, and the process of creating queer socially engaged performance as those species. So we both perform a sort of eco drag, right, that imagines the human body as a potential conduit for these other species to communi communicate through. Um, so here's some um, drawing and writing of Eli's. Um, I've been working with Eli for the past few months off and on, helping them to try and figure out how to notate their horseshoe crab movement practices so that other people can experience it for themselves, uh, which is no easy feat. Um, and about a month ago, Eli asked me if I would do a horseshoe crab movement exploration myself. Um, sorry, my computer's freaking out. Um, so I did, and in the process, I was reminded of something that I grappled with in my tick work, which is in the process of becoming something else, you can't eliminate your own humanity. Right? You're constantly back and forth in conversation with trying to become something and realizing your own physical boundaries. And this is kind of the greatest part because you get to, um, it's all uh, through the act of trying. Like that's the best part is just seeing what happens, coming up against those, those barriers, those frustrations, those doubts, and just continuing to move through it. And there's always sort of a shift of perspective that comes out of that. So I wanna show you um, the video that is this first, my very first attempt at becoming a horseshoe crab. Um, so I want to say that I'm relatively new to, to video editing. I've been having a lot of fun playing with it um, during the pandemic. And I've just been enjoying using this filter because it's sort of, um, I feel like it, it encapsulates the way that I'm feeling about the like trying to become something else, but, but failing and sort of being sort of in this in-between space of, of experiencing the non-human while also being very human. And so having the colors and the, and the blurred lines sort of distorted in that way, I've been enjoying. So this was the first attempt and it um, made me think a lot about mimicry versus condition-based um, experimentation. So what I was doing in this first practice was much more mimicry or biomimicry based of being like, okay, my leg's going to be the horseshoe crab tail and I'm going to puff my back up to make this shell that's really big and, and you know, feel what that is in my body. Um, and that's great because the, the, whenever you do that, suddenly all these sort of condition based questions come out of that, like, oh, what, what might it like to have legs extending from my abdomen? What might it feel like to put my face in a tide pool? What might it be like to have a wave splash over me over and over again and feel that repetition in, in relationship to the earth? Um, so yeah, again, I, so that brought me to this next video, which is the second attempt that's, that's more based on these condition-based experiments of asking these questions about the conditions that a horseshoe crab um, experiences, their sort of life situations and conditions, and asking myself what it might be like to, to feel that myself. Um, and actually, I'm going to read a little bit about what I wrote. This is the writing that I tried to articulate to Eli what this experience was that I felt like was a complete failure, but also a really great sort of honest, yes, there is no way to do this without being human. It's all like both and all the time. <laughs> so um, this is the writing. What is it like to be face down in a tide pool? 
Is my exoskeleton a support mechanism or a burden? Am I frustrated by the way it inhibits my movement? Does the horseshoe crab experience frustration? Attempting to become something I know so little, bit of, so little about is paralyzing. But move anyway, this is trying. Dark gray, dark blue, blue blood. I'm cold, but not as cold as I imagined. I didn't know that this was the sensation I've been craving. My spine arches away from the water. I feel the weight of my black sweatshirt hammocking back towards the water. It wants to be closer and so do I. My belly, my vulnerability and my core. Five sets of legs extend from my navel. Can I make it over this rocky ledge? My human arms want to help, but I don't let them. Should I? Five walking legs extended from my navel. I'm delightfully clumsy. This is pleasurable. I don't normally move like this, and that's the point. I am a horseshoe crab. I am not a horseshoe crab. I am human. I am both. Be both. Be a contradiction. Attempt to become. So I will play the video now. Oh, and I'll say the sound score to this is, a, is another sort of early COVID times when we were all thinking we were going to become something that we're not. This was me playing with um, making sound scores based on humming. So I just thought I'd layer that as a, another sort of like attempt at trying. Here we go. Mm -hmm. So this is a lovely Krista Tippett quote as well. What we practice, we become. Um, obviously this sort of struck a chord with me, um, but I actually in this instance, in this sort of framing of physical empathy practices, I wanna, I wanna change it to what we practice, we get closer to. Um, there's obviously never a complete physical transformation that I manifest, but it, it, I do feel, feel a change. Um, so we're always filtering information through our own bodies and our own life experiences, and that's fine. Um, but it is an experience of, um, a practice of experiential intimacy. Um, we get closer to the experience of another being and therefore experience a sort of intimacy with that. Um, and so I've been just really loving thinking about that, thinking about the closeness um, that is manifested from these practices or just a shift of perspective, um, a different relationship that I'm starting to have with the more than human world. Um, so anyway, getting back to Eli, thank you again for your questions, your prompts and shared curiosities um, that have really helped fuel my investigation. So shortly after this horseshoe crab exploration, I was talking with Mary Jays on the phone, um, sorting through some of these findings. And um, Mary prompted me to think about the pros and cons of vulnerability and sensitivity practices, especially right now when so many people are feeling already raw or anxious um, or disconnected. And we question sort of whether or not asking someone to conduct a practice enhancing sensitivity and vulnerability was particularly harmful. 
Um, and I thought about this seriously. Um, and after a while, I realized that there's this really interesting sort of feedback loop that I think exists between um, vulnerability and, and protection. Yeah, because depending on our human experiences and traumas, sometimes we have a hard time discerning which is sort of the right path to take for ourselves. Oftentimes we're protecting ourselves unnecessarily and missing out on something or making ourselves vulnerable um, in a way that, uh, you know, ends up protecting us in some way. So it can kind of go either ways, either way. And I just wanted to underline that the goal of these empathy and sort of building sensitivity practices is to simply and hopefully profoundly increase our awareness of ourselves in relationship to our environment. Um, because the more we know about where we are and how we relate to it, the better we're able to determine how and when to protect ourselves and how and when to open ourselves up. Um, so the thistle, I think, represents this, or sort of is an extreme manifestation of this duality between protection and vulnerability. Um, it has these like beautiful, strong um, thorns, uh, really like a hardened armor that is protecting this incredibly soft, light, vulnerable seed inside. And it's able to protect itself fiercely while also cultivating the development of this sort of essence seed. Um, so I wanted to show a video, a dance video that I made after playing with trying to just catch thistle seed, thistle seed at the farm um, one day, which is really difficult because they're so easily affected by any shift in air current that it's almost impossible to grab them and really fun to try, uh, but it inspired this um, dance uh, improvisational practice and writing, I should say. I tried to capture you in my hands when you were flying, but you were more deft than I. I didn't know that when I cut you down the other day. I didn't know how quickly you would transform your flower into seed. I didn't know that your seeds were so magnificent in design, that you had the ability to both root deeply into the earth and fly sky high. You depend on the wind for survival and it is always there to assist your travel. Your suitcase is light and you blow about naked. while making visible the swirling currents of air. I found your children in large numbers, some still clinging tightly to your mother's bud, some still bearing the purple tint of your skirt. My fingers delighted in their downy tendrils how is it that you, with your prickly, armored stock, bear seeds of the softest kind? Where did you learn to find balance between holding your ground and allowing yourself to be moved? No, oh, get it again. Come on. Okay. I tried to capture um, so now I want to do uh, another uh, movement exploration uh, inspired by the thistle that I'm calling firming and flying. So we're going to be two separate practices. Firming is intention and design based where we're playing with the scaffolding of the body, thinking of how the thistle is armoring itself. So um, creating shapes that are that feel supportive 
um, just playing with sort of what exists, the scaffolding architecture of our body and sort of how things can be placed against one another to create sort of architectures of support. Yeah, so we'll just be moving through finding different shapes and orientations of ourselves that feel supportive that maybe aren't how we're used to moving, but just seeing our body in a way and just sort of playing around with ways that they can interlock or create um, some structural shape that feels supportive. And then with flying, it's the opposite of um, prioritizing feeling and, and sensing the external environment. So we'll do it with our eyes closed if that feels um, safe and appropriate to you. And instead of the sort of intention and design based of like, uh, this is how I want to see my hands working together and my arms manipulated. It's going to be imagining that, that something is moving us, that we get to be affected by our environment and that we get to release control for a moment over that decision making of what happens with our body. That sort of uh, embodiment of that, um, that thistle seed, that incredibly light, vulnerable, um, moves with every shift of air current seed. Um, so we'll start with firming first and um, you can coordinate it with your breath if you want. Um, I'm going to and just do um, maybe five to ten um, just shapes. So we'll sort of like build a shape on an inhale and sort of hold it and find the resiliency of it. And then on the next breath we'll find another shape. So on the in breath we'll be finding it and holding it exhaling and then we'll use the next in breath to find another shape. If you don't want to worry about the breath, fine. This is just a way of playing with the architecture of the body and finding different support mechanisms for yourself. So um, I'll just give us 30 seconds to a minute to just play. Um, don't worry about timing your breath if that feels too confusing. I'll say you can also play with the architecture around you. Yeah. Um, so use, use chair, table, computer, whatever, to find how your architecture relates to other architectures around you. Let me find one last. Great. And you can stay wherever you are. Um, and we'll just shift right away into the flying exercise. So right away, closing your eyes and just tuning into the sensitivity of your skin, being really aware of the air currents shifting around you, if there are any, um, any temperature that you notice in your environment. And some of this is, is a little bit faking it. You know, we're not outside probably, and you're not feeling an extreme gust of wind around you. So try and really sense the slightest, the softest, the most, most imperceivable shifts in your environment and just allow your body to sort of subtly or um, dramatically respond. And sometimes this takes some waiting.
Great, and we can settle back in from that. What's fun about that exercise sometimes too is that you start creating your own <laughs> air currents that then you get to feel. So you're kind of generating your own wake, which is interesting. Great, so one of the perks about living at home right now is that I get to go through old photos and find, find images like this. This was, I think, my first uh, dance recital. Um, and I was getting a kick out of preparing for the, this event because it made me think back to this moment when I was in my first uh, creative movement class. And then even later when I was studying modern dance in college and um, this sort of stereotype of modern dance as, as becoming a tree or being a tree. And I felt like I was always defending modern dance and, and wanting to prove that it was something more intellectual and academic. And of course it is, but also I just am finding it funny that it's come full circle. And now I'm like, no, become a tree. <laughs> I think that, that's the goal. <laughs> that's the goal. Um, I want to show one more uh, attempted empathy video that I made trying to become a rock and trying to become a cornstalk. And it's also paired with some language just about this experience overall. Um, so I wanted to say that just that I chose to lead these exercises inspired by resilient plant species as opposed to trying to conduct one of these more full-bodied becoming exercises because each of these subjects, the deer tick, cornstalk, rock, um, that I've tried these sort of physical empathy practices with have come out of a specific curiosity that I have of coming, coming across something and being inspired by it and wanting to try it out. And so there's no way that 
describe that for, for folks. Um, that said, uh, I'd be really excited if anyone did want to try these out and share them. Um, if anyone's inspired to do so and want to share them with me, this is my information, my email and my uh, Instagram handle. Feel free to tag me or send me anything. I would love to create a library of attempted physical empathy practices that other folks um, conduct. Um, that'd be really fun for me. Um, but I felt, especially during this time when we all need a little bit extra fortification uh, and resiliency that um, doing the resiliency uh, invasive plant practices would be more appropriate. So um, almost last thing, I want to do like a funny acknowledgement of these delightful contradictions that I'm coming up against or, or things that I've, I've found myself like being concerned about during this research. Um, <clears throat> because invasives do cause harm <laughs> by overcrowding and outshading other plant species. They do cause ha economic harmship for farmers and they can cause health hazards um, because of the herbicides we use to control them. And so I've sort of been in this, this battle with myself because I, I, I understand this and also I can't sort of get past our sort of culpability. The fact that like the way we define invasiveness is always in relationship to ourself and the way that it can serve us. Um, so again, it, in the ways that it's doing harm, like we introduced most of these plants. We like stole them from their native lands and brought them here and expected them to do something very specific for us, which maybe they did not do. Um, as far as like health hazards, like Again, we brought them here. They grew in spaces that we didn't want them to grow and we're choosing to put herbicides on them. So it's actually, again, our bad, you know? Um, <clears throat> also, I'm, I'm trying to look into research that I don't think there's a lot conducted, but I'm just starting to be curious about um, plant trauma. Um, and if there is, like, I know there is a lot of research about plant um, ex experiences of trauma and that they can, they can recognize um, specific bodies that have inflicted harm on them. Um, I know there was a study at Washington, Washington College in Maryland um, where they put a plant in a room and hooked it up to all these sort of sensory devices and had someone come in and cut a branch off and it reacted very differently. And then that person left the room, it calmed down. And just by the person re-entering the room, the plant went crazy again. And so it was able to acknowledge the, the presence of, of harm, you know, and in relationship to its own trauma. And so I'm just curious about, and maybe someone knows more about this than I do who's, who's on this chat, but if there is research out there about um, specific invasive growth patterns that result from trauma and relocation. Um, and yeah, because I, I kept trying to look up whether invasive species that are invasive here harm plants in their native environments or if they act differently somehow there. And I, I can't, I haven't come across much information about that. I'm curious if it's out there. Maybe someone knows more than I do. Um, so aside from that, um, I wanted to do one more practice that I do uh, in all of my dance or movement classes to, regardless of uh, the size or level um, that's just sort of acknowledging community building as a resiliency practice. Um, and this is often a uh, vulnerability exercise because I ask folks to stand and just be and have sustained eye contact with one another. It's a little bit different on this platform. And um, for those who have their video off, I don't expect you to turn it on. I, I think I just want to take a few rounds of breath and just sort of for yourself and for myself, just sort of scan through these, these faces, these places that we're in community with right now, um, even if it's just the, the written word of someone's name um, and just sort of see them, acknowledge them. Um, and I'll specifically be thinking about thanking them for being here. So um, I might just take five to 10 rounds of breath and just sort of scan through who's here um, and just sort of honor them being our community in this moment.
I could just do this forever, um, but I think I'll choose to, to end here. So thank you all so much for being here. Um, if you want to stick around and have questions or anything, feel free to, to ask anything or respond in whatever way you want. If you have any questions and want to put them in the chat, I can help moderate those over, or you're welcome to unmute yourself um, and ask a question yourself to Scott. Hi, Scott. This is Amelia. Um, thank you guys for hi, putting this together, and it's really great to be in community, so thank you for that last piece of practice. Um, just going back a couple of slides ago when you were talking about plant harm and, and relocation. Um, I actually just moved. And so one of the things that I guess I've learned this from my aunt and just some, some of the people that I know that are, are very connected to plants and are very connected to like taking care of and being stewards of plants and land. And so uh, one of the practices though is upon moving, keeping the plants kind of not watered or not like overstimulated, I guess, so that as the moving is happening, um, letting them just kind of adjust to that shock. And then once they, once I found their home, be it in a window, a new windowsill or a, a new shelf, you know, then I water it and I kind of take a moment to say like, this is your new home. Welcome. You know, and just kind of thinking about those types of adjustments, and I'm, and I'm totally curious about how invasive species um, undergo that type of relocation because there isn't the additional care of like, oh, this is my house plant. I have a particular affinity to this. You know, this is just a, a, a plant that is being transported on someone's boot, or it's being transported on a ship, or it's, you know, whatever it may be. So um, it, I think it's a really interesting question to look at, and, and I'm yeah, I guess I, I'm not sure where, where I um, picked up some of those pieces. I can't quite point you in the direction of that type of research, but that is a practice that I, I am currently in the process with. Thank you, Amelia. <clears throat> hey, Scott. Um, I, I wanted to share with you something that I think you will be amused by. Uh, where uh, a few years ago, um, an artist um, that I had met who's up in Vermont and was going to the idea swap at that the New England Foundation for the Arts holds each year. Um, and I had been talking, we both got to talking about things in our life outside of dance. And uh, Toby mentioned plants and then plants kept showing up on Toby's Twitter feed. And so um, when Toby was coming down to Boston for a, a different project, I had suggested bringing Toby one of my plants. And then at the next idea swap, Toby brought me one of their plants, um, which we then began discussing as a way to kind of like take care of each other's, take care of each other, like within the idea of an ecosystem, like we talk about an ecosystem within the dance world a lot. And um, it's now kind of like blossomed into something weird that I hadn't ever expected where like people, instead of giving each other flowers at the end of a show are now giving each other plants and it feels very much like it's causing this um, empathetic response not just to the plants but to each other and to each other's um, like the things that each other has grown in a way that feels like it's expanding out into the sense of an actual like community ecosystem that's caring about each other that feels like it's a very different way of going about some of the exercises that you've been doing and that it's not like out in the wild but looking at like what are we putting into our own spaces and how are we just by tending to something being able to tend to something larger through the metaphor of that um and i just figured i'd share it because i was thinking of that while i was watching this today and also this was freaking phenomenal and just what i needed mm, thanks that's funny i it makes me think my my parents received a orchid plant from friends of theirs this week and it was both like a oh my gosh this is beautiful and Oh God, how do I take care of it? I'm going to kill it. <laughs> What's the maintenance of this thing? You know, my mom researched that you, it needs three ice cubes a week and it like melts over time, you know, <laughs> and there's such specific care, but also, um, yeah, it's really interesting to think about plants as, as 
gift uh, as gifts that we give and receive and, and what that means and how it what it holds for people. Well, and it's funny too, I think, because like we can really appreciate that one plant is going to need like a ton of water and one plant is going to need like a lot of sun and one plant is going to need this. And yet like when we deal with each other, we kind of treat each other like one size fits all. And there's something about having to take care of plants and managing that even like I had separated out a spider plant that someone had given me a few years ago this summer. And one of the plants that it was in was out on my back porch and one of the pots was out on my front porch during the summer. And when they came in, like one of them's leaves have gotten really wide and one of them's leaves have gotten like really long and spindly. And I was thinking like, it's funny too, that even in taking care of them, I've totally warped them in two different ways. And, you know, there is this sense that we can see what happens with that, but we don't, we don't give ourselves space to do that as much with people. And there's something about just observing that, that I think has been really looking at this idea of where empathy comes from and how that gets developed, I think is really coming out of your practice and the things that you're drawing attention to. Yeah, I just wanted to say hi and how cool it is to see um, your the horseshoe crab experiments in context of this larger conversation that you're having that i'm also having that we're all now having so thank you so fun and so satisfying and um cool like vol like i felt all shy as you were horseshoe crab dancing i was like oh it's <laughs> i'm i'm your vulnerability to become the horseshoe crab uh was able to transcend time and space and make me feel exposed <laughs> it's great well done thank you eli and it's appropriate to note that eli and i have never met in person <laughs> our entire relationship has been <laughs> you know, <laughs> preceding the pandemic, but mostly during the pandemic. So it's lovely to see you as I see you normally. <laughs> uh, I'm seeing that. So this is a strange thing to talk about. I, I'm talking, I'm doing a collaboration with a, uh, another farmer um, who's also a dancer. And we were talking about how much plants actually don't like being touched. Um, and as dancers, how much we like being touched, or, or, or maybe some of us as dancers like being touched. And so the strange relationship of plants like really um, not wanting to be petted or dusted off necessarily, like there's, they have a very different reaction to touch than we do as humans. And it's just been a, um, a new conversation. I don't know that it's exciting and amazing, but it's just been something we've been talking about. Thanks, Beth. Um, I love you, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> I love you too, Scott. I have a question about that. Is, is it that plants specifically don't like being touched by humans? Because plants are touched frequently by animals. And other plants. And of course, other plants, yeah. Do you know the answer to that? I do not. <laughs> yeah, it makes me think about, about what Karen was saying too about just how we treat plants differently or have sort of depending on what they look like or you know the hierarchy of you know this plant's pretty so I'm going to treat it one way versus I'm going to step all over grass and not think twice about it you know just the way that we yeah I don't know the the hierarchy of care <laughs> and how that fits into, yeah, how we re relate to plants and to each other and how, that, how we determine that. Scott, it makes me think of the experiment you were talking about, about the trauma to the plant. And when the human left the room and came back in, I think of, you know, a head of lettuce growing in a garden and a rabbit comes and nibbles on it. If the rabbit came back with the lettuce plant freak out, like that would be an interesting control experiment you know, is it species specific? Because I could totally see plants hating to be touched by humans. That would be very understandable. <laughs> yes, I want that experiment. Uh, I'm seeing there's a question from Kristen Heavey in the, in the chat that I want to read. I really appreciate being embodied. I 
find it easier to enter the practice without the video because the visual two-dimensional screen seems to take over my pathways in a way that being in person does not. It makes it hard to get all the subtle feedback from other people who would otherwise be in the room. Do you see this time being a time of figuring out how to be a part in some way? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's also why I've chosen to be with what I'm able to be with. Um, you know, I'm choosing to move outdoors and try and increase my intimacy with the more than human world because I miss, I miss that interpersonal relationship. I miss that feedback loop of initiating and receiving physical information. And so, yeah, I mean, it, and it, it is sort of tapping into a different, we exist in such a different um, time, space, energy than, than plants and other animals and, and even rocks. You know, I spent uh, like 20 minutes just lying on a rock today being like, this is our partnership. We're both gonna be still for a bit. And I definitely got something from it. I don't know if the rock got anything from it, but you know, it's just, it's, I'm kind of delighting in, in a way in this time that, you know, it would just be so obvious otherwise to be in a room dancing with other, other folks and um, receiving that same pleasure that I get out of dancing with other people. And it's, yeah, it's challenged me to think outside of that. And I, I am receiving information in a very different way, but that's really feeding me. Thank you. Scott, that just brought up a, a thought and a question um, about somewhat of the, the helpful assumptions that we can make while we are in nature and, and while we are interacting with plants and animals around us. Um, almost this, this assumption that, you know, maybe the rock does get something out of this. Maybe I don't need to know that for a fact, but if I can just assume that if I'm really receiving here, maybe also the rock might be receiving. And in, in that way, really utilizing this, you know, great metaphor, thinking about plants and all the different ways that, you know, they respond to interactions, to human touch, to different environments, how we treat, you know, a house plant versus an invasive species, all these, this great metaphor, but to um, then relate that back to the assumption of, of course, we make impacts to every person we engage with and every person around us, there's some continual feedback that's happening, you know, whether you're in an actual conversation and can contact with them, or you're just kind of in the environment passing by and through. And so it's, I think a, an interesting play there that, you know, if, if we do just make this assumption that the environment around us is responding to our presence, be it inanimate objects or, you know, um, yeah, how might that then translate to the metaphor when we're dealing with other humans? Yeah. Scott, you have another question in the chat, and maybe we'll have this be kind of our last question to wrap up the, our evening together. What are some of the best ways you have to inspire emotion in your audience? Um, I think this is it. <laughs> I think this was sort of the offering that I'm that I'm feeling I, I can I can give right now sort of based on my own personal research and, and experience through this moment that this is the thing that's sort of fed me right now. Um, and, and has been really emotional. I think what Amelia was talking about of the assumptions of of the, the give and take and our, our sensitivity to how, it's so much easier to be sensitive to how we're affecting the environment versus knowing how it's affecting us. And I think that's what I'm trying to tap into too. And the assumption um, that you're talking about, which is totally accurate, is also what I'm talking about, you know, when I'm leading the exercises and, and say something like, you might have to fake it a little bit. Like sometimes that, that sort of feeling is a is a guess is a is a reach 
you know, it's like being still and being next to a corn stalk and being like, I don't know, it's trembling. So I'm going to try and tremble. But then what else? So I just feel like I want to do this. And is that coming from me or is that being fed through them? Like, who's, who's giving who what impulse at what moment? Um, and I think that's, that's where the play comes in too, because there is so much that we don't know about how we're communicating and how we're vibing with one another that just, there is a little bit of like a faith practice in it, of just like a trusting that something's there and, and following it. It's so that like asking questions and, and just moving through the answers always that um, is what I find fun and um, uh, yeah, is is like a great research that's feeding me. Um, Fantastic. I think we're gonna wrap up for the evening unless anyone has like a question on their heart that they need to get out. I wanna make sure we leave time for that one that's been sitting there waiting to be asked if it exists. Okay. Um, thank you all truly, truly so much for joining us tonight. When I first spoke with Scott about um, doing this event for us. It just kind of fell on this day. And I just feel like what Scott offered us is exactly what I personally needed, which was connection and empathy and also a little movement and like letting go and faking it of just like being with myself and my body, but also with all of you. So Scott, thank you all so much. Thank you, Scott. This has been a beautiful evening. Um, and this recording will be made available if anyone wants to revisit this and kind of do some of these movements again. Um, so thank you all truly so much. We hope that we'll see you at some future events to like shamelessly plug our programming. We have Latinos Who Lunch who will be with us in two weeks. Same time, same place, different Zoom link, still free um, podcasting duo based out of Nevada. And we'll actually be talking about the Western landscape and kind of the mythology of the Western landscape and how art fits into that and how the Latinx culture does and doesn't. So it will be in some ways a continuation of talking about land and connection. Um, so please join us for that. And then later in December, we have Kirsten Vickery, who I saw earlier. She's here. She'll be doing her BFA with us in December. We hope that you'll join us for that as well. So thank you all so much, Scott. Thank you for offering this connection with our community and with ourselves and empathy and the more than human world. Thank you so much, Enza and everyone. Thank you for coming.